Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Calling Within podcast. Today, I've got Danica Kennedy with me in the house. Danica, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. I'm very excited for this chat. I've written down some very exciting questions. We're going to chat about spirituality, yoga, healing, training, all the lovely stuff. Very excited. Yeah. <laughs> so for the listeners that don't know you, can you describe your background and who you are today? Yeah. Yeah. So my name is Danica Kennedy. Who am I? And I mean, I, I struggle with that question because I change every day at the moment. But I'm, I mean, my roles are a yoga teacher, a personal trainer. I'm a dog mom. I'm a recent van lifer. I'm a passionate yogi myself. I'm into my fitness, my training, holistic lifestyle. I have uh, been handed some challenges in life that have, let's say given me the space to grow, learn more about myself and connect with, connect with more like-minded people by sharing my journey and my story and my thoughts and feelings around life on my social media, on my Instagram mostly, mainly. So yes, that's me. <laughs> wow. And I've been following you for some time now and you're a very inspiring yogi. You do incredible complex asanas like scorpion all the handstands the human flag or whatever it's called and all these <laughs> complex calisthenics versus yoga postures and it just looks amazing and i'm very much looking forward to getting to your level at some point mm -hmm. but how so you mentioned the importance of sort of yoga and i also know you are a fellow spiritual seeker how did that journey start for you how did you start tapping into spirituality and healing yes yeah, so I do feel like it knocked on my own door, but it, 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 it felt like it was triggered off the back of a holiday that I had in Thailand in around 2013, 14. And that was the first time that I was out of the Western world. So I hadn't, yeah, I hadn't been around a different type of culture to the West. And that experience, it was, yeah, it was pretty life-changing for me because I... I couldn't believe just how little these people had on the surface from a material perspective. But but then I couldn't help but notice how happy they they were. And it was just a real turning point for me because at that moment in time, I wasn't really happy with where I was in my life. I was, I was in a relationship where I, I wasn't very happy. I was in a job that I wasn't happy with. And I just wasn't really happy with myself, to be honest with you. So it was, it was, a, it was a trigger point when I came back from that trip. Everything's, everything seemed to fast track me. I mean, I, I would always say that this spiritual journey and this like path to, should we say like transcendence and just transcending your, your own shadows, your own, your, your own issues, traumas, whatnot, that is, is, I feel like it's already written in the stars. So I feel like everything probably in my journey from birth, from prior to birth is, was part of my spiritual journey. It was always going to happen, but definitely I can say that that, that Thailand trip was a trigger and a turning point for me. Wow. Mm. And actually, first time I was in Thailand last year, and that also was a life-changing experience for me. So it's funny you mentioned that. Mm -hmm. And so you're in Thailand, you're realizing, okay, I'm not really happy where I am in life, but something needs to change. Mm. What do you then do to start tapping into that a little bit more and exploring where to go? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm a little bit all guns blazing. So I just got back and just within one year, my life was unrecognizable. So I was, uh, I was in the corporate environment, which we've spoken about. So yeah, I was in the corporate world and I was actually, just like a side note, I was, I was going through a lot of health issue. I had a lot of, I had a lot of pain and I had, got, I'd had a lot of accidents, broken bones. I'd had mumps. I'd had all these physical issues. And at this moment in time, I had a real bad issue with like my neck and my chest. So I was already taking quite a lot of time off of work for this discomfort that I was in. And now looking back and seeing that this was all related to the amount of pain that I was in by just going to this job every day, because it was just so uncomfortable. I would wake up like crying that I had, that I had to go in. So maybe, maybe my body put a, <laughs> put a, put a block in for that. But yeah, so, so I, I decided to leave that role and go full time into personal training. So I, I had already fallen in love with fitness for myself. I'd struggled with disordered eating my whole life. I was extremely anxious when I was in my young adult, my teens. And the gym was a saviour for me. And I found that 
maybe about five years before I was in that, whilst I was in the corporate world. So I really fell in love with that process and that was my ticket out of the corporate world. So I, I went into a full-time personal training course and within two months I was fully qualified. So I had quit my, quit my job, which was a big, big, big deal for me to quit that. It was very safe for me to stay there good salary how they how they do they yeah. trap you in that way because I had a company car it was you know and everybody that I spoke to was like you don't do it yeah you know you're going to be working terrible hours the pay is rubbish it's like really competitive I was just like you know what I don't care I don't care I, I valued the way that I felt I had to because I was just suffering I was unwell I was unwell I was depressed and anxious doing what I was doing so it was just felt, felt like I had no no choice and it good, felt good for me to move into something that I genuinely was passionate about. I absolutely loved it. I loved what it had done for me. So, so yeah, PT course and then just split up with the, with the guy that I was with. It was just not, not working. So we parted ways and I ended up moving back to my flat. And so, so, so yeah, and then one, one, when you change one thing in your life, everything else starts to change with it. So, yeah, very, very, because I was doing something that I loved, it didn't take long for my business to pick up and and I was very busy and I and I and I loved it so so yeah that was eight years ago that I started my PT, PT course wow yeah. that's amazing yeah and I've got so many things that I can relate to with what you're saying about the corporate job and just being in a job that you don't like mm. I remember I went to this holiday once um just a week holiday by the beach the same day that I came back to London I fell ill Literally the same day. And I was like, mm, maybe I caught something on the plane, but they technically wouldn't be long enough for the symptoms to come out. And the next day I can't go to work. And now looking back at it, I think what happened is my body just literally protested to me going back to the job. Like I hadn't consciously picked up on that, but I was so unhappy. I felt very guilty about this unhappiness. I was like, oh, but it looks so prestigious. Oh, but it's paying. Oh, but I worked so hard for it. Oh, but this is like what my uni degree was for. But I was freaking miserable in there. And then my body just protested and gave up. Literally the exact same day I landed back to London. And it, the body just knew that it had to be back in the unhealthy environment. And it just said, no, like I want to self-preserve myself. So I can totally relate to what you're saying about this. Mm -hmm. And I guess then my follow-up question uh, would be, why do you think it's so important for us to move away out of those unhealthy environments. Because what I see with a lot of people in the corporate world is that they accept and stick with it. They know it's, it's not the best deal for them, but it pays money, it's safe, it's, it's giving them something, but they're suffering through it for a purpose that they see in themselves. Why is it so important for us to actually get rid of this mentality and move into something that we love? Well, I think the corporate world is, there's nothing necessary. I think you can still find balance. So. The corporate world is going to exist as long as we have the economy in the way it is, right? And I think that you can still, you can still find a way to be content within yourself and go into that corporate world. That's not to say that it isn't difficult and there is going to be some people that it isn't right for. And if you, I, I think if you're feeling that grating feeling and you wake up and that gut feeling initially is, I don't want to go into work. Like my first thing was, I can't, like, what can I call in sick about? That was always my first thing is I like, just call in sick. I, I can't, I just can't go in. So I think if you're at that point where your, your actual, your own mental, physical health is, is being affected. And also I just think we can't ignore that calling. It's very obvious when we are in the wrong place. I think there's only so long that you can go on kidding yourself that, that this is, right for you and I think if you do continue to to do that you end up getting sick like physically or mentally or both it's all linked so it won't be long until yeah your 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 health starts suffering because that energy and discomfort has to go somewhere so yeah if you're living every day and doing something that is not your true in your true nature and what your heart is wanting then you wind up sick for sure I 100% agree and I was listening to Deepak Chopra when he came to London and he brought up this concept of epigenetics yeah and he basically said that bad genes manifest when you're in a bad stressful anxious depressed environment so you literally owe this to yourself to your health to your future self to go because your literal health depends on it like it's just going to be 
a matter of time. Mm -hmm. At some point, those things will manifest, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And with people like Gabor Mate, the, the author that wrote When the Body Says No, it's like now well documented how psychosomatic some diseases are literally just because we suppress everything inside and we ignore those callings and intuitions. So I'm very much passionate about that and I'm so happy that you've uh, realized this for yourself and that you, you've left and you found your passion. And another thing that I, I didn't know about you, but I want to touch on if that's okay, is um, the relationship with food that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, what did it look like for you in sort of those challenging moments? Mm -hmm. And how do you recommend uh, for people that are struggling with this um, to recover from this? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So my... I didn't suffer with any eating disorder, but my, my eating was disordered. There's a quite a big difference between the two because I was extremely aware that I was very underweight. I really, really didn't like it. I felt extremely uncomfortable in my own skin. And for me, my, I was actually now looking back and reflecting, I was so anxious. Um, I had so much anxiety in, in me that I just couldn't eat. I just never felt hungry. I felt like my throat was like closed up and I suffered really bad with IBS for a long, long time. So I would have severe bloating, extreme discomfort, which would, which would make me not want to eat because I, my stomach was just full of, which was all caused by stress. It's a syndrome, so it's all caused by stress and, and similar to you, but in the reverse, I would go away on holiday and it would disappear. So then I would cut and I would come back um, to England and come back to my life here and my 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 old work, my old job, and it, and it and it would flip flare up again. So that's how I knew that there was something wrong with my environment, my life that was causing me to be unwell. So yeah, so the disordered eating was very much like not feeling like I wanted to eat. This was from quite a young age as well. I think that I was extremely anxious from a younger child and just carried that with me. But yeah, I just did. I just never really felt hungry. And I would just, I would maybe, if we're talking my early 20s now, I would eat, gosh, like a, like a little mini Philip burger from KFC. Literally like nothing. I'd just drink green tea and be on drinking lots of caffeine, fueled on caffeine. Yeah, and then, and then have something small for lunch. And then I would stuff my face for dinner eating mcdonald's and biscuits so it was it was just it was it was there was no awareness or knowledge on how to fuel my body there was no awareness or knowledge on the effect that food has on the body and the effect the the effect that stress and anxiety has on the body i'm i'm 37 so this was we're talking 20 years ago I mean, it just wasn't really, there wasn't really social media back then, so it wasn't spoken about. So it's only now on reflection in the last 10 years or so that anxiety, mental health has been such a prevalent thing in our society that I'm now able to reflect back and go, oh, you were anxious. Like, no one knew that because no one was really speaking about it. And there's probably lots of people around my age that can also relate because, yeah, we just, we just got, <laughs> got through it. Um, so yeah, so that was that was the 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 eating, but fitness and training really helped me with that with that like massively because it, it increased my appetite. I was doing lots of movement, and obviously fitness and exercise is a stress buster. It's like the most amazing mental health and th th therapist that you can that you can get. And I didn't realise that that was what was happening at the time. I was just starting to get addicted with the gym and how it made me feel. And I, and I was eating better and then I was looking better and I felt better because I was looking better and then I would eat better. So it just, it was uh, an, an amazing catalyst for me to start this journey because our spiritual health is, is hugely dependent on our physical health. And it all really starts with what you're putting in your body and how you're what you're doing with your body if you're doing anything with it if you if you're moving it mm. how you're moving it so I love that and also just like with my own personal journey with fitness and yoga and training I've only recently realized that I feel more energized after the gym because before I used to think oh gym is going to exhaust me I don't want to go mm. but actually now paradoxically I have more energy and I'm like mm. hmm this is weird like that's what everybody's talking about like there is actually more energy after you go to the gym, after you do exercise. And yeah, I, I love what you said about food as well. What we put in our mouth is so important. And now there's so much more the link between food and disease and spiritually as well. Like 
the consciousness of the food that we put in ourselves, like whether it's ultra processed, has been on the shelf for like two years, and then we put this old dead energy into us versus like a, a nourishing, fresh, I don't know, salad or mm. smoothie. It's just like, it makes such a huge difference to how you feel. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. It really does. It really does. You literally are what you eat. You are what you eat and everything is energy. And if you think about everything holding energy and then you are, you are ingesting that, you, you become it. So yeah, so I'm, uh, I'm super strict on what, what I eat. 90% of the time I would say I try and eat organic, I'm fully plant-based, vegan, have been for eight years. So, so yeah, and wow. that's, all, that's all part of that journey too. Yeah. How, how does being vegan compare to your old lifestyle and diet? Do you see any noticeable differences? Oh yeah, loads. I mean, loads. I, when I first started my PT course, I was eating a, I was a meat, meat based diet. I did two bodybuilding competitions and ate a lot of meat, a lot of eggs, a lot of salmon, fish. I was yeah, doing crazy things. Um, I switched, I actually switched be, for my, uh, for, initially for my own physical health. I, can, I had read about dairy and I, as I said, I was suffering quite bad with my digestive health at the time. So I was just, I was at a loss with what to do. I was just in so much discomfort. I was saying it to someone the other day. I was talking about it. I was saying this to my mum actually. I was like, I used to take like 20 peppermint oil tablets because I just didn't know what to, what to do. So, so yeah, anyway, dairy was the first thing to be eliminated from my diet for, for digestive reasons and it, and it really made a difference. So, so yeah, then, then that just progressed. I had read a little bit more about plant-based diet and health. So I thought, let me give it, give it a go. Then I tried it and my, my body just, just loved it. And I, I, and I just go by how I feel. And that, that is, that is my guiding force. That's incredible. Yeah. And do you think that switching to the plant-based diet helped your IBS and obviously going into a lower stress environment? Oh, 100%. Yeah. Uh, 100%. No, no doubt about it. No doubt about it. It's... You don't struggle with IBS anymore? No. That's incredible. Very rare, very rare. I, mm. I had a flare up last week mm -hmm. and it was the day that I was moving out of my flat and into my van. And like we were saying, you said the moment you landed, literally, I actually felt like a in my son and I was like oh, I knew I knew but I knew it was energy as well I knew it actually just had to that I was going through quite a big transitional time in my life and that it that my that something had to hold it because I didn't feel stressed in my mind but I knew there was stress present so it it had to be processed some somewhere and it was it was it was through that so yeah I had a week of of discomfort but that is so rare I can't even tell you the last time that that happened, I would struggle to remember probably another high stress time in my, in my life. But yeah, that, that's a lot of it was being caused by inflammatory foods that I was eating. So once that was eliminated now, it really is just if there is any like high anxiety stress, then there's a chance that it will flare up. Yeah. I don't think we'll ever completely go. It's, I think my body's way of dealing with stress, it just, that's where it holds it. I think it's true for a lot of us. It's the emotional, it's the emotional brain of the body. The gut is holding so much. And we'll, and we'll maybe speak in a moment about plant medicines, but, but a lot of the work that I did with plant medicines was, was all around my gut and pulling, pulling stuff out of this area. So I think, yeah, a lot of us have gut issues. A hundred percent. And I have so many follow-up questions to everything you just <laughs> <No>. said. <laughs> <laughs> I love this. This is like my conversations, mm -hmm. deep healing, spiritual, mm -hmm. everything. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess like to tackle this anxiety point that you mentioned. So you're obviously into all of those things like yoga. You've moved into a lower stress environment. You've adopted plant based foods. What do you think? And you've also done plant medicines. What do you think helped you with anxiety the most? Because that's such a big issue. And for me as well, like I'm a very anxious person, especially at work. Like I struggle with anxiety so much. What are the sort of top tips for people to overcome their anxiety? I would say the biggest thing that's helped me hands down is my yoga practice. Because what my yoga practice taught me was how to breathe. <clears throat> and when I learned how to breathe properly, that was when I was able to regulate my own nervous system. So calm my heart rate. And that's what yoga practice does because the whole thing is a moving meditation. It is all through the breath. And obviously it's a, well, not all practices, but I'm talking about 
like a vinyasa flow practice is quite strenuous physically on the body so it raises the heart and you have to in order to continue to follow the class you have to be able to breathe and if you don't you'll fall out of sync but this is how we learn and this is what I teach a lot of people which sounds crazy but a lot of a lot of what I teach is people how to breathe how to really really breathe and use their diaphragm so that probably is my my Number one thing is to be consistent in a in anything that you do. But if you can be consistent in a yoga practice, that is when I say to all my clients, it just ticks all the boxes because you're getting your your spiritual health, your mental health, your emotional and your physical. All of them are getting looked at and more for that practice. So, yeah, it's yeah, definitely been fun, fundamental for me to overcome or not even overcome anxiety because I don't think you can ever really... Anxiety situations are going to arise in life where you are probably going to feel an experience anxiety and experience depression for me and what yoga has done is it's given me the ability to separate myself from these emotions and feelings basically separate myself from myself right from from my own identity and be able to be able to sit back and be the witness to the feelings and stuff that arise around me and to be able to just sit and breathe and make more conscious decisions around what's happening my life for the last few weeks has been extremely stressful very very anxious situation but um, I can honestly say that I've been able to sit back and breathe and, and just be the witness to what's been going on rather than get involved in it. And then what ends up happening is you just make it worse. So surrender is key. And that is what yoga is, is all about and what it is there to teach us. I can't agree enough. Yoga is just so amazing on all levels. And for a lot of people, they think yoga is stretching in the gym. And it's not. It's literally everything combined. And it's so holistic. It's so all encompassing that's like you can't even imagine like when you go there and the breath is so important and myself included but most people forget that yoga is about the breath I, I literally remember in a yoga class uh, a yoga teacher was like yoga is just breathing that, that that's it like that is the point of yoga and I was like what I thought it was about doing crazy handstands <laughs> scorpions all those fancy asanas but no and doing things like pranayama, ujjayi breath during the class is so important and it just makes such a difference. Especially when you hear your own breath, it just makes you so much more aware about what is happening inside and outside at the same time. It's incredible. It's funny you mentioned that because I, I had a client last week and we were working on handstands and I had to literally stop what we were doing and stop the class and get her to come it was an online session and we were just, I just had to get her to come down to the phone and I said right we cannot continue until you find that connection to your breath because until you do it's like it's like reversing backwards the handstand's never going to come and I did say to her we need to remember what this practice is all about right the handstand is to teach you and to teach us about ourselves not the other way around so it's Listen, it's great to do the asanas and the postures that look really cool. Of course it is. But actually, if you take the focus off the asana and focus on the connection to yourself, the, the way that you're moving, the way that you're breathing, the way that you're transitioning, the way that you're setting up, then the asanas come quicker. And I think that's why I have been able to progress in my practice I don't even want to say quicker because some people will maybe have progressed much quicker than me. And But for, my, for myself, I feel like my progress has been consistent, consistently improving because I haven't really been too bothered about getting the handstand. Like I work hard for the handstand, but I ha I'm not in the energy like I want to get the handstand. I don't really care. I love learning about myself whilst I'm learning the handstand. I've learned... And I'm learning so much about myself, literally just by putting my hands on the floor and kicking my leg up towards the air and trying to catch it. I, honestly, it's just so simple, this stuff. It's so simple. It's so beautiful. It's so fun. And, and yeah, and, and the, when you stop focusing on what it is you're trying to get, the irony and the paradox is it, it's there and it'll come. Yeah. When you let go of the outcome, things are manifesting. Yeah. 
just like that. It's crazy. And yeah. it's very paradoxical, but that's how it works. Yeah. Because you're surrendering and you're trusting the universe. You say, I know it's going to come whenever is good for me. God and the universe, they know better. Yeah. I, I trust the process. I surrender. It will come. Whereas if you're so obsessed, like, oh, I need it now. I need it now. Then you kind of push it away. You, you 100% do. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's like that. Yeah. We know that, that manifestation, what you focus on, what is it, what you, what you, what you resist persists. I don't know that, that saying, but yeah, it is. If you, you've got to let go of the outcome and just focus on doing the work, having fun, showing up, not getting too caught up. Because I say to all my clients, cool, right, you're working on the headstand. The minute you get the headstand and you can hold it for 10 breaths, you're bored. You want to go and find something else that challenges you and that you can't do. I'm always seeking to do stuff that I can't do. And that's how you end up progressing because if this, and I think this is what a lot of people do or don't do is that they, they, they're doing the stuff that they know they're good at and they know that they can do for fear of whatever, looking silly or getting it wrong. But then the problem with that is that you don't, you're never, you're never learning new things. So yeah, I say to my clients, don't worry about looking silly. Don't worry about falling over. Don't worry about not being able to do it. Don't worry about not being able to do it for the next year, <laughs> maybe two. Don't worry. Give yourself two years to nail the handstand. I've been working for nearly five. It's only just starting to come. So yeah. So yeah, it's another reason why I love this practice is because I can't do it like that. Yeah. I want a long-term discipline. I need a long-term discipline. Totally. And also for everybody that is listening and that is scared to look silly, the amount of times I fell flat on my face when I was trying to do a peacock posture <laughs> is just like, it's too many times. It was just ridiculous. Like my yoga teacher was just like laughing. Like why? Like what's happening? Literally, I just couldn't, I just couldn't hold myself up. And it's basically the posture where you need to lift your legs from the floor and I just couldn't do it. So my face just ended up hitting the floor every time. At least you're close. <laughs> yeah. This one. Yeah. 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 So that was that was a, a nice self-learning moment where I've learned that who cares? I, I'm going to fall. And that's how life is, right? Like you're going to fall many times before you learn to walk. And that's what babies do. But guess what? They continue trying to, to do that. Yeah. And then they eventually learn how to walk. They don't give up and not try to walk ever again. They, they don't cry. They literally just like, oh, it's a, it's a game. You fell once, you go, get up and you go. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. So you mentioned plant medicines and as far as I understand that they played a very vital role in your healing and spiritual transformation. Could you give us a little bit more background on how was your experience like with plant medicines? Which ones have you tried and what have you learned? So I should probably give a bit of background on myself, my own character. So from a young age, I was always a bit of a daredevil and always wanted to to do the things that I was not allowed to do, All right? So um, if my mum told me not to touch something, I'd just immediately go and touch it. So throughout my early teens, I was uh, exposed to, in the London nightlife, lots of different drugs um, and I used them. Yeah, so I was never um, afraid of trying substances and things that were banned by the government. I always questioned why the government would ban certain things because I was always aware that alcohol was so vile in so many ways. It was caused a lot of pain in my life, in my upbringing and in my own personal life from my, when I was growing up for, for drinking it myself. And um, so I used to think you sell alcohol in every single freaking corner. It's disgusting. So, but you're telling me I can't have this. So let me try this. So that's a bit of background. I was always partial to trying the things and doing the things that I was told not to do. So when it came to plant medicines, they literally, they literally came knocking on my door, right? So my, an old client of mine literally arrived to one of his sessions to my front door with a grow your own magic mushroom kit. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. So they just arrived to my door and this is how this is how this stuff works, right? They just they just yeah. come to you. So they actually came to my front door and he left it with me and I was like, "Cool. We would often speak about spirit, spirituality and we spoke we we spoke about ayahuasca and we were both keen on exploring these plants but in a more holistic conscious ceremonial way shall you shall we say but I had never experienced anything like that before recreationally in the party scene um, and same with him so long story short I started growing my mushrooms 
And I just started like on a Sunday afternoon, just taking them on my own. So I would just set, get my set up. I didn't really know what I was doing. I just put some music on and I just literally take three to four grams, lay down under a blanket and just lay there and just face whatever came up. And I can tell you, I went through some seriously uncomfortable, difficult times in my living room, in my flat, just laying there, rolling around on a sun Sunday afternoon. And I didn't, honestly, I didn't at the time know what I was doing. I, I didn't, now again, on reflection, when I look back, I'm like, whoa, there was some serious healing and unraveling going on during those processes. And I can still remember some of my journeys back then. So that just continued. I probably did about 20 journeys on my own, just like that. Three to four grams every time. Um, yeah, sometimes more, sometimes more. I would, I would, I had different forms of, of mushrooms. So yeah, sometimes I had them in oil form and I was able to, yeah, I was just exploring. I didn't really have any rules. Sometimes I would wake up mid journey and I would just feel the calling to take a few more drops. And I would, I would just, I was just extremely surrendered. And, and, I, and looking back now, the medicine was really guiding me to, to do what to do because I ended up then being called and feeling the need to bring other people and into this work and started running my own little ceremonies with people so so yeah opening it up and to, for other people to be able to access the space wow and so you always took them by yourself just alone in the room with a blindfold and a playlist, I assume. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I did, I, I probably, so the, this is maybe course of 20 over the last like three, three, four years. But the, after I started working with the mushrooms, maybe 2019. And at the end of 2019, I drank ayahuasca for the first time. So I, that was my first ceremonial experience. So it was the first time I was exposed to any sort of shamanic work. I'd never heard native American drumming I'd never I'd, I'd never I'd, it was totally new to me and it blew me away it was a big ceremony there was about 25 people and it, and it blew me away in, in every sense of the the word that experience my first one but yeah from off the back of that I really then learned then how to come at the mushroom journeys for myself. So I started then to learn how to hold space for myself in a more shamanic way and just started working with just sage, palo santo and just coming out from a more sacred, intentional perspective. Wow. And how did the plant medicine compare to the other drugs that you took? Because uh, the people like for me, I used to think all drugs are the same. And now I know they're not. Like there's a difference between psychedelics, plant medicines and other drugs. How, how do they differ in terms of like the high that you got? Yeah, oh, they're so different. And, and honestly, what, what, what the, the biggest difference is your set and your setting and your intention. I used to, I would have people come to me for plant medicine journeys working with mushrooms and, and the people who had already experienced mushrooms but in a recreational like party atmosphere ended up having an experience that was maybe a bit more challenging and difficult because there was an expectation there. But actually, when you internalise the experience, so I guess this would be similar with, because I haven't done any recreational drugs, I've only been working with plant medicines for many years now, I haven't, I haven't really worked with or, or touched any man-made I call them like man-made drugs like MDMA ketamine those types of things and I honestly didn't they were probably the only ones that I work with or that I've, that I've used and taken but there's a there's a huge there's a huge difference and I can't really like I'm saying I can't compare I know that people use MDMA and ketamine for um, and I know that's being worked on and tested and researched for what helping people with PTSD anxiety the same way that mushrooms are being also tested for and work with for the same thing so I can't really it's 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 very difficult to compare it's difficult it's difficult for me to compare one plant medicine journey to another working with the exact same plant use work using the same playlist in the same set and setting because they're they are always so different so so different but yeah, plant medicines, you, 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 there is no comparison to like recreational 
recreational drug use at all whatsoever because the plant medicine experience is 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 to be is focused on healing it's around self exploration it's around your own consciousness and and consciousness in general and it is a extremely beautiful sacred experience that um should be respected in my opinion that's not to say that i disagree with people using mushrooms and other at all whatsoever but for me now when i work with them i want it to to be in in that in that way with in like intentional yeah sacred and with 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 purpose and respect that's so beautiful because i that's what i feel intuitively that it's very important to cultivate your own relationship with the medicine because the medicine is like its own intelligence and the way how you relate to this intelligence like the intelligence would know so they'd know if you disrespect the medicine, if you speak badly about this. But if you come at it with respect, I, I'm getting goosebumps right now. So it's like, it probably means something. If you come to it with respect, with this amazing intention that it's something that's going to heal me and the humanity, that's a very different vibe. And for people that are having very challenging trips, I don't know too much. I heard that apparently if you don't let go and if you resist, that increases the, the likelihood of a challenging trip. But perhaps it's also with the people who didn't really want to take the medicine in the first place or they weren't cold but they took it anyway at the wrong time for them so that that could be the rationale I would be curious to hear what you think causes those challenging trips yes it is a good question and I have witnessed it m- many times actually in different plant medicines and, and it is a lot of the time it is there is a resistance somewhere to the medicine it happened with me with my very first ayahuasca experience it was I but, but I was just going to go into explaining how I resisted the medicine. But in uh, just as I was saying that, uh, uh, I was so meant to resist the medicine. If I didn't resist the medicine, I wouldn't have seen the, the ego, the, the extremely strong layer that I had to get myself through. I had to resist, to witness that resistance within myself, to transcend it. Does that make sense? So I, I would never say that there's any, even the people who maybe go in for the wrong reasons, like what you said at the beginning, the medicine is so intelligent. It knows you're coming before you've even taken it because this is all, everything's already, it's all happening at once. Anyway, so they, they know you're coming. So it's, yeah, it's already written, but yeah, you are correct. Nine times out of ten, it is, it is some sort of resistance in us where, where the, where you're, you're fighting against the, the medicine and you, you've taken it. You, you, I, I, this is what I explained to everybody before. And this is why I think it's important to, if you are going to work with plant medicines, just make sure that you've either, you, if you're doing it yourself on your own with your, with yourself, then just make sure that you've got the set and the setting and everything right. And you feel good and comfortable. And if you are doing it with someone, yeah, just make sure you, they feel right. But for me, I explain to everybody before I explain this to everybody and say that, that it is normal to want to resist whatever it is and to just to, to breathe through it. And just, it's, it's temporary. Everything's temporary. It's temporary. And after three, four hours, it's going to be fully out of your system. And it's just there to teach you something about yourself. It is not, medicine doesn't add, it, it, it removes so it's not giving you trauma. It's not giving you a bad trip. It's not giving you anxiety. If there's anxiety there or, or stress there, it's, it's highlighting what's in us already. I love that. And it brings like all of those things to the surface so we can actually witness it. Because a lot of the time, again, we suppress, we sweep things under the rug, but the medicine just like, there it is, face this, confront it. Because if you don't, And how do you grow, right? Like you have to overcome something to grow, to literally move forward. If you don't, if you're not willing to pass over this hurdle, then you're just going to stay on the same place. Can I ask you if you're able to share, because I know a lot of people don't like to talk about this in detail, but what was your most significant plant medicine experience? What, 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 what did it feel like? What did you learn from it? It is difficult to, to say because each of them have given me something and each of them have been like a notch to the next. You know what I mean? But I, I 
when you ask me that question, I'm immediately brought back to my first ayahuasca experience because it was so profound. She was, she, she, she really slapped me. She slapped me up. She, she really, on the first night and on the second night, I had this incredible birthing experience. But, but yeah, I mean, I, I, the medicine, right, can show us what we need to be shown in many different ways. So my first ayahuasca, ayahuasca experience was extremely profound, extremely visual, extremely like, oh, this huge like death and then this huge rebirth the next night. So it was, um, it has the story behind it, it really does. But then I know other people who have also had really profound experiences and haven't had them in that way. So Sometimes I'm a little bit reluctant to share my experience because I don't want people to go have their experience and then think that there should have been like this or like or like that. But yeah, I I I can I can honestly say that that ayahuasca, yeah, my first ayahuasca experience was profound. It was incredible. It was amazing. I learned absolutely loads about myself I met incredible people I think that's another thing what maybe isn't maybe spoken about so much about the plant medicines is it's the people that you meet the people that I met and that retreat were people that I connected with and connected me up with other connections and and the yeah the people that I met were had it played a huge role in in who I am now and where the rest of my life took me um, beautiful people you never really want to leave that environment it's it's it truly is um a wonderful experience not just the plant medicine the aftermath and one thing I, I will say about plant medicines and I think it should be said is that these plant medicines don't do the work for you there is a lot of people that I know also that have done work with plant medicines and they are they haven't really changed very much because you can, it's like looking into a really nice box and seeing all the, you can put the lid back on if you like, you can see all the stuff that you need to work on or see all the, all your trauma and, and, and things that you need to face in everyday life, but you can quite easily put the lid back on it. So the plant medicines do not fix you. Don't expect to go to one of these retreats and come out healed you have to do the work. There, ha there is many other things that take place to transcend and to, to become closer to who you are, home to yourself and living your own truth, whatever you want to call it and label it. But I think it's important to say that because I, they don't heal you. You heal you. They give you tools. They give you direction. They give you ideas. Um but they, they don't tell you what to do. They don't tell you how to do it. You still have to, to find your own way. And they're great wisdom keepers. But yeah, you, you've still got to do your own, your own work. You can't keep knocking on their door. They won't answer. Um, also, I've, I know people that have gone to ayahuasca and they keep going and they keep going because they want more and more answers and ayahuasca will just say no. And the plants will, you just, will just get the blank, black darkness. <laughs> so... So yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. I love this message because it feels like there's no place to hide, right? Like this intelligence knows. Knows a lot better than you. So, And you got to show it, right? It's about cultivating this relationship. That's what I intuitively feel. I haven't really heard many people speak about this, but that's what I sense. Like you need, to, it's like with God, right? Like you need to show God or whatever you believe in that you are willing to do the things for that thing that you believe in, right? Like you have that thing, whether it's God, Jesus, Allah, whatever, you have this in mind when you do it. And that thing knows because it's more intelligent than you. Guess what? Like it created you if you believe in that. Same with plant medicine, right? They know. Mm -hmm. If you're going with ill intentions, it's why would it, why would it give you whatever you're asking for if the intention is bad, right? Karma, the intention is the most important thing. Yeah, 100%. It knows. It can feel you. Energy is, you can't, you can't hide exactly what you said. You cannot hide. I'd like to move on from the plant medicines a little bit. And so you've done so many incredible things on your healing and spiritual journey, but I'm curious, given all of those experiences, how does your spiritual practice look like at the moment? So you're obviously doing yoga and you've done so much work on yourself, but what does, what does spirituality mean to you now and how do you practice it? 
That's a really nice question. So, it's, yeah, it's a good question. My spirituality, I mean, for me, it, at the moment, it's looking like following my heart, being heart-led. And I have just recently moved out of my static apartment flat property into my non-static motorhome caravan. It's, it's, a, it's a camper van, converted camper van. So that actually has been a huge part of my own spiritual journey because it was something that really scared me. It was something that I knew was a calling. I wanted a different way of life. I wanted to take things a step further and just remove myself from the matrix as best I could. I know you can't really ever fully eject, but, but yeah, it felt like it was one step closer to that. So at the moment, yeah, part of my spiritual journey is, is, is transitioning to living in a van. But in the last 12 months, I took up journaling. Journaling was a hugely beneficial practice that I added and it was something that I was like oh god journaling for years I like tried to do it I didn't try very hard but I just thought that journaling had to be like getting cool stickers and making everything look nice and I just started writing I just started writing so last year I decided one of my new year's resolutions was going to be to get up at five five between five and five thirty to meditate and to journal and my journaling it just was just I just write down anything whatever you whatever you're feeling it doesn't even have to be words you can just scribble literally whatever so I'm really committed to that um, and I'm still pretty much doing it now and now waking up at 5 five thirty is just normal for me my body clock is in that in that way and that that changed my life because I bought myself basically an hour or two hours in the morning where nobody else was up and awake, it was, there was something about the energy at that time where I could, I don't know, I could just feel the stillness. I could just feel there was not really anybody else up and it was just such a special sacred time. So I would do my meditation in the morning, just 10 minutes. Sometimes I would chant, sometimes I would do half an hour, sometimes I would do five minutes, sometimes I'd do my dra drama, I'd just be intuitive, whatever what meditation it was. Um, and then I go and do some journaling. And it was the journaling that has created where I am right now. Because before I started journaling, I had no idea that I had any dreams. I didn't really know what I wanted to do with my life. I didn't, I wasn't dreaming. I wasn't dreaming. I wasn't planning. I wasn't making any plans for where I was going. And my life was just this hamster wheel of just going through. We know what it's like. You wake up, you brush your teeth, you eat, you do your, your work. For me, it was doing my clients. Going out for a dog walk, coming home, going to the gym, coming home, showering, eating, going to bed, waking up, doing the same thing. So that 5 a.m. time bought me a couple of hours to actually start to go, right, what, what are we doing? What do you want to do? What do you want to do? And even no matter how ludicrous it sounded, I just wrote it down. So yeah, last year I was writing down that I wanted to be an online coach. I wanted to be doing online training courses. I wanted to do an online membership program. I wanted to travel, live in my van more. I wanted to have more time with my dog. And 12 months later, I'm literally living that life. All my clients are online. I work much less hours. I spend all my time now with my dog. And I'm living in my van, traveling. And, and, and yeah, I can, I can say those two things, waking up early to, to meditate and journal. That was three things. But, wow, yeah. that is incredible. And I'm so happy to hear that because, again, it just shows the power of intention. Most of us want something, but we don't really know exactly what it is. I mean, we're all guilty of that. And we have this like idea in our mind, oh, I just want to be happy. I just want to be healthy. I just want to have money. But precisely, like how much money do you want to have? Like, what are the things that are going to make you happy? Is it a relationship? Is it like a, owning a house? Is it work? Like we just know this abstract concept, but it's actually so important even for manifestation to know exactly what it is. Because how is the universe going to give it to you if even if you still self don't know and then you can't ask for it? It's probably going to come in some way or another, but isn't it going to be so much nicer to move towards something or a goal that you can see? Whereas at the moment, for most of us, it's just like within this fog and you can't really see what it is and you think you need to go there, but like how can... And I just really love that journaling brought you there. It showed you that, well, actually you do have dreams and it's so incredible that you're now living this dream and it just shows again that it's totally possible for anybody that wants that. Yeah, it's an extremely powerful tool, extremely powerful tool. And it's important also to mention that it's pen to paper, not on the phone. 
yeah. it, there is a neural chemical happening when we put pen to paper and you're literally writing it into existence. It's actually like the the creative feminine, right? The the create the creation of what it is we want to do in our dreams and our visions, and then the the masculine element of writing, and it's like the birth of Christ, which is our our manifestations. Wow. Yeah, really powerful. I love that. And another thing that I'm I'm dying to ask, but you went to a TV show. <laughs> yeah. I do I pronounce it right? SAS. S A S. S A S. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So I, I didn't really know too much, I guess, because I haven't grown up in the UK. But it's basically it's a show where you're put on some remote location or jungle, and you're basically made to do military training, very hardcore. Why did you go on that show, and how was the experience like for you? So, so it's a it's a TV show called SAS Who Dares Wins, and it's basically where uh, normal civilian people go and experience the SAS, which is a special forces, basically in, in America, but training training regime and training program. So why did I why did I sign up for it? Well, before I actually signed up for the TV show, I was so this was seven months after my dad passed away. And I, I was like a savage in the gym after he passed away. I was just doing crazy things, really. I was like going down to the river in like minus temperatures and just sitting in there and not even flinching. And I was going to the gym and, and just just I was think I was ex- I had experienced and was experiencing so much pain that I was struggling to find anything t- to feel anything if that makes any sense I was just tr- I was just trying to feel something so so I was pushing myself quite heavily in the gym nothing really felt like it was challenging me enough so I started searching on Google for some ex military trainers to just basically drag me out of bed at 4 a.m. and make me run I just wanted someone to to put me through my paces I couldn't really find anybody. And then I thought, there's a TV show. I'm sure they do some SAS training. I wonder if it that... Because I didn't really watch it. I'd seen clips of it many years ago. I actually remember it was a, it was a, it was a moment. And it was actually a, a, a link as to why I ended up applying. Because there's a moment many years ago that I just caught watching it. I think it was my partner at the time was watching it. I remember seeing a girl on it. She was holding a rock above her head. And she just, this, this, this grit on her face. And there was like sweat and tears. And I, I was just, I don't know, I just saw something in her. And, and, and that was that. And then seven years later, I had this download. I was like, there's that program. You saw that girl. <laughs> we want a bit of that. So I went online and lo and behold, they're recruiting. They're looking for applicants. Long story short, I applied. I went for the audition had to pass a series of fitness tests to get into the audition, which I did. And then I ended up being a candidate and recruit. So yeah, there's 20 recruits to go in. There's over 10,000 people that apply for this show. So I just felt super grateful and everybody just feels really grateful just to be there, just to have the opportunity to do this experience with four of the most elite special forces and SAS military uh, personnel from the UK and the US that were taking us and 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 that and that was it so this particular one was in Vietnam in the jungle and I I wanted to be challenged I wanted to see what where my limits are what I'm capable of and that show delivered that 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 course delivered everything and more I was I've never ever ever in my life been more mentally physically emotionally mentally challenged spiritually challenged in in my entire life (laughs) there will never be enough words to explain what we went through in there you know it's it was it was made into a tv show right it's this is a we're in an army training camp Yes, and it is in the middle of a of a jungle in Vietnam in a national park in the middle of nowhere, and there is just it's a fly on the wall documentary. It's not like a glamorous okay action. All right, we are living and breathing this environment twenty four seven, and everybody at home gets to see one hour <laughs> a week of our 24 hours in there. So the, what, what was shown on the TV show and what actually happened in there is two very different things. But but yeah, the experience itself was 
was priceless. One of the, if not the best things that I could ever have done. It showed me who I really am, what I am truly capable of. I did 11 days in there and I finished with eight hours of being interrogated after not eating for nearly 28 hours and stood in stress positions, emaciated, mentally unpicked, very mentally unstable when I came out for a couple of weeks, PTSD. So, so, so yeah, that experience was life-changing and I would not be doing anything of what I'm doing today. Living in a van is an absolute breeze. Everything I do, I can compare and say, yeah, but you did that and you got through that. So there's very rare anything that comes to me in life. Over the last two years, dealing with my dad's suicide and being 11 days on a SAS uh, training camp and surviving, there's not very much really for me now. I don't know, maybe there will be. This will be sent to me, but I don't feel like there's very much that I haven't overcome. And, 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 and if there is, I'm just like, bring it. I know I can, I know, I'm, I know what I'm capable of. I know what I can handle and I know who I am. Wow. Oh my gosh. I, I've got goosebumps. I am so shocked and so inspired that you did that. It just, to me, it sounds very extreme and crazy. And I think that's so amazing that you've done it. And even despite the PTSD and all the hardships, you still came out of there and you're like, yes, that was an incredible experience. And I think that's such a great mindset to have and just to look at what it taught you. And now everything is in comparison easier for you. And I think it's so great that you were probably given this opportunity to make you stronger and to help you to live a more fulfilled life, just having this crazy thing that happened to you a couple of years ago. But wow, it's mad. I'm, I'm lost for words. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else you want to touch on before we wrap up? No, I think, I, I think I'm good. Absolutely love the chat. Thank you for the amazing questions. Yeah. And if anyone wants to catch me, I'm on uh, Instagram, Danika Kennedy underscore. And you can follow, yeah, my, my van life journey on there, my yoga journey and just my life, really. I share a lot of what, what I do and who I am on, on Instagram. But thank you for having me. Danika, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for coming on.